live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Science Cafe. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. So glad to see so many fabulous faces joining us for a little bit of science on a Thursday night here inside the museum. I always say it's the best place you could be for science on a Thursday night in Raleigh, probably anywhere in the Triangle, is right here inside the Daily Planet Cafe for our weekly Science Cafe. Uh, if you didn't know, we host the show every Thursday at 7 o'clock, so you can come back every week, meet experts, learn something new, maybe meet new people who also like to learn new things. This is a kind of a nerdy bunch. If you just look around, you'll get it. But we uh, thank you for laughing. I'm sorry. We have a great time every Thursday night here, and we have incredible topics. Uh, tonight's topic, of course, we're going to be talking a little bit about birds. Who likes birds? Do I have birders in the crowd? Yeah, lots of folks. And there's like three or four professional birders in the room, I think, even, so the stakes are high tonight. But, but you know, looking at uh, tonight's topic and then chatting with tonight's guest speaker, uh, the stakes are kind of high, right? Like we're talking about extinction, we're talking about species loss, biodiversity, conservation, and knowing that human activities are a big part of the problem, maybe most of it, uh, that means that we also have the responsibility to be the solution, right? To do what we can to make sure that species aren't disappearing, um, especially from our own backyards. And so tonight's guest, Curtis Smalling, Director of Conservation with Audubon, North Carolina, is going to give us some insight into what's happening with species in the state and in North America with this very special report, Survival by Degrees, which I think everybody in the room should have a, a summary copy, little handouts on your table, the little flip out booklet, really cool and great information. So uh, make sure, you know, share this stuff out. Talk to people after the cafe. Maybe you should tweet it. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for booing. Uh, but as we, as we, oh my gosh. Wait a minute. One of the biggest threats facing North America's birds today is in the room. And I'm not talking, right there. I see you. Family, keep an eye on that one. Keep that cat on a leash, okay. I think we're gonna be talking about that a little bit later as well. Put your hands together and welcome to the Science Cafe stage, Curtis Smalling. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank you all for coming out uh, on a Thursday evening in what used to be winter, although this week hasn't felt much like winter. Um, it's not? <laughs> I have to eat it. That's what, yeah, that's what they keep telling me. I've got to really eat it so that uh, you can hear me. Um, and thank you. And do that if, if I start talking with my hands like that, um, which I tend to do. So um, my, again, my name is Curtis Smalling. I'm the Director of Conservation for Audubon, North Carolina. I've been with Audubon for about 18 years now, thanks to Chris Canfield, who hired me uh, originally with, with Audubon. Um, I think that makes me one of the you know, 10 or so surviving Audubon employees that are, have been there that long. So um, Thank you so much for spending your evening with us. Um, I do want to talk about climate change and birds. It is a, it is a topic that's um, kind of at the forefront of Audubon's work. Um, for somebody like me who is a bird nerd as a kid, um, you know, I kept daily checklists when I was growing up of what I was seeing. Um, you see it, you know, you see the effects of climate change and, and of the change in bird distribution and abundance and um, diversity and all those things across our state, some of which is probably due already to climate change. Uh, obviously, other things affect birds, so habitat loss and, and other kinds of things, which we'll get into just a little bit as we go through 
uh, the program tonight. I do live in Boone uh, most of the time, um, so I appreciate the chance to work on my tan up here. Um, <laughs> usually we're a little bit colder than you are here, but um, forgive me, I'm not used to the bright lights, so you may see me uh, squint and, and run for cover here. But um, let's, let's get started. I want to allow plenty of time at the end for questions, um, so let's, let's dive right in. So in October, uh, the National Audubon Society released its report, Survival by Degrees, uh, a look at um, some recent efforts to model the effects of climate change on birds. Um, that report um, is one of the largest of its kind. It collated, gathered a massive amount of data, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and it looked at some new ways of looking at the effects of climate change, the way that climate change works on birds and bird populations. We'll dive into that in a little bit, in, in a little more detail. But it's these things that climate um, exacerbates or makes harder, uh, makes makes it harder for birds to to survive and be productive. We'll talk about those in, in some detail. And then the other thing that you may have seen and heard about is about two weeks prior to the release of Survival by Degrees, a report came out, a lead report from Cornell, which we were a partner on, the Three Billion Birds Report, as people are calling it, that showed that over time, over the last 40, 50 years, we've lost about three billion birds out of the, the, the pool of breeding birds available every spring, okay? Uh, you may have questions about that at the end, and I'll be glad to try to answer um, how you jive all those numbers. Uh, three billion birds, but what if cats kill two billion a year? What does that mean? If, how, do, how, do you, how do you figure that math? So we, we can talk about that um, during the Q&A time. But the nice thing about the survival of deg uh, degrees and the thing that separates it from the three, three billion birds report is that it looks forward. It projects into the future what we think climate is going to do to birds and bird populations. The data that was used for this report is the largest assemblage of bird data ever assembled. So it's about 140 million individual bird records from about 70 sources. Has anybody in the room ever entered their bird data into eBird? Okay, anybody ever participated in a Christmas bird count or the Great Backyard Bird Count? Your data is in this report, and that's an important takeaway from this, is we need those community scientists out there collecting this data. We'll talk about this at the end as well, about some things you can do. But your data helped drive this report. Keep, keep that in mind. It's an important way that people can help. Um, and again, we'll, we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. But a robust data set. It also looked at, like the first climate report that came out about five years ago, a climate and birds report, it looked at the kind of climate address, if you will, of birds. It looked at about 40 different variables uh, related to climate. All those bird records then are kind of assigned an address based on the variables. You know, how much, these, where these birds occur, how wet is it, how hot is it, how cold is it? Um, all those kind of variables start to give us a sense of what the address, the climate address of a species is. One of the things we did on top of that, though, is, you know, climate acts on any kind of habitat, right? So if you have a patch of forest like Umstead, and then you have a developed area, you have to factor in the habitat differences. So human land use was factored into this, vegetation cover was factored into this, and also surface water, because some of the birds, as we know, if you go to the coast, some birds have to have water. Some birds have to have salt water. Um, some birds have to only have fresh water. So the surface water and where it's at also greatly influences where birds occur. The other big piece of this project, and the thing I think that makes it a more hopeful message in the end, is we ran these scenarios at different temperature scenarios. So kind of the the business as usual, um, the high scenario, if you will, or if we take action and hold the global climate warming to one and a half degrees, which we're, we're close to that now, um, if we hold to that, that has one effect on bird populations. If we let that number creep up to 2% or even to three degrees, we see different effects on our birds. And so this report is the first time that we've modeled the differences between holding the line uh, or letting climate just 
continue to deteriorate from a bird's perspective. This is an important point, and we'll talk about this kind of as we go through the individual species as well, what, the, what those different scenarios mean for different species. So if we look at those differences, you, you might imagine if you look at the handouts that I gave you once you get home, you don't have to look at them now, there won't be a test at the end or anything. Um, for every species, we modeled the current range, so where are they now? And then under those climate scenarios, where do those climate addresses, if you will, persist? And where are they lost? And so for the one and a half degree, let me see if I can use this fancy pointer. So for the one and a half degree, you see a certain amount of loss, the dark red color, and at three degrees, you see considerably more loss of suitable habitat. This is for wood thrush, a kind of common bird across most of the eastern U.S. So the modeling that we do allows us then to, to basically assign some numbers, some percentages. How much of the habitat is predicted to be totally lost? How much is worsening? How much is stable? How much is improving? Because, you know, for certain species, a shift may occur. This, the, we'll talk about this in more detail in just a minute. But they may be able to shift over time into the more suitable kinds of habitats and climate addresses. Um, but for a lot of species, um, for two-thirds of the species modeled, of the 604, 389 show significant declines and are at a higher risk of um, extinction and decline. If you look at the groupings of species, like which groups of species are most vulnerable, you see that, an, and it's a little hard to see here, but a little bit easier in the handout that I gave you, a number of our forest birds are particularly susceptible to climate change. A number of our high Arctic nesters are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Um, some of the birds, as you might expect, that do better under the climate change scenarios are the generalists, the urban birds, the ones who are used to kind of adapting to people and to what we do to the landscape. Um, so we see less of an impact there. Um, from a pure climate perspective, our coastal birds do a little bit better than our inland birds, but they're also much more vulnerable to some of the risk assessments, to, to sea level rise and other things. Um, I'm going to break this down a little bit for you when we get to the later part of the section that talks about North Carolina birds and what this report means for North Carolina birds. So don't, don't worry about this right now, but it is in the handouts. So this is kind of what it looks like big picture across the whole U.S. So again, the, the blue is kind of um, areas that are becoming more suitable and the darker the red tones, the worse those places are becoming. You can see the difference overall. This is all species um, rolled up together. You can see the difference between one and a half and three degrees. In fact, about two thirds of our birds are benefited pretty significantly by holding at one and a half degrees. The other thing that this report looked at in some detail is are the threats that come with climate change. You know, one of the most confusing things I think sometimes about climate change and, and about birds in particular is one of the questions we often get is, well, you know, birds can fly. Why don't they just go where it's more suitable, <laughs> right? Um, what's the what's the big deal if uh, you know if urbanization happens or if sea level rise happens? Why don't they just go somewhere else? And in some cases, they are forced to do that. Think about birds that nest on a, an island in the estuary, for instance. It might be inundated by sea, by sea level rise. That they go find a different island or try to, um, or an inlet or a beach face or whatever, and, and try to find a new place to nest. But it doesn't really work that way for a lot of our um, interior birds, our, our inland birds, our, our kind of land birds, as we call them. Uh, we'll talk about that part of the equation here in, in a little bit. But these kind of critical climate threats are things that climate um, makes worse on the landscape, right? So these are threats that, that start to impact our birds in, in kind of pretty obvious ways. For us here in the east, um, most of these fall under four main categories. So extreme spring heat is, a, is an effect of climate change that affects the east disproportionately. Um, 
Heavy rain events. Um, most of us are seeing this already, right? Um, if you look at total rainfall amounts, a lot of times that's masked a little bit. So in Western North Carolina, for instance, Grandfather Mountain, close to where I live, their average annual rainfall hasn't changed very much, but what's happening is it's coming in like six big events instead of spread out over the whole year. So, and that has a really big effect on birds can. Uh, if it happens in the spring, it can inundate nests, it can drown nestlings, um, it can cause hypothermia, hypothermia to the, the incubating females. There's a lot of impacts from these heavy rain events. The other one, which we often don't think of as a climate effect, is an increase in urbanization. Um, this actually is well modeled and well documented to happen as a result of climate change, not just other factors like economics and those kinds of things. As droughts cause farm loss, um, farmers tend to abandon farms and move to more suburban, urban settings. As temperatures rise, people seek relief from that, and so they build second homes in the mountains and at the beach. Um, and so we see this increase, this ramp up of urbanization effects from climate change. Those three, really, the urbanization, um, extreme rain events and hotter springs tend to affect most of our land birds in North Carolina. And when you add sea level rise to our coastal birds, that, that group of four threats really become the primary threats for North Carolina. 98% of the U.S. is affected by one or more of those climate scenarios under the three degree. But under the one and a half degree, you can see only about only about two-thirds of the U.S. Has, is affected by one of those, so a pretty significant reduction. We see that get even better if we look at the number of species. So if, if we look at um, species that are affected by multiple threats, right, so two or more threats, um, a vast majority of species are affected under the three-degree scenario. But only 20% of species have multiple threats if we hold at one and a half degrees. As I've said before, over 90% of the birds could be benefited by some reduction um, in these in climate through climate mitigation. So holding to those lower de lower degree gains make a huge difference for our birds. These multiple threats, especially in the breeding season, um, affect some of our most iconic places. We're going to talk when we get to the, the next section about North Carolina specifically, how the Appalachian region is very vulnerable to this and how our coast is very vulnerable to these threats. One of the things that this report does that the first report didn't do is really give you some tools to look at that data on a local level and to make it personal. How many of you have a favorite bird, even if you're not a bird watcher, right? Most of us like to wake up in the morning and see our cardinal or hear our Carolina wren out our window or if we get a chance to see our great horned owl in the neighborhood or whatever that bird is that we love the most, right? You can go on our web tool and learn about climate's effects on that bird. And not just the birds that are highly vulnerable, even birds that might benefit for climate change. You can read about what the model says about your favorite bird. You can put in your zip code or city or county, and it will give you a list. This is the interface on audubon.org, information in the handouts on how to, how to get there. But you'll come up with a page that lists the vulnerable species, the moderately vulnerable species, the stable ones, the ones that, that basically um, don't have an effect or, or aren't seeing an effect in North Carolina. You can toggle back and forth between the three degree, the one and a half degree. Um, it will also show you a map of your area and what it looks like from those threats, um, from things like extreme spring heat. This is an area kind of centered around Raleigh here. Um, you can also see what a, what a change from three degrees to one and a half degrees does to those threats. So I encourage you to go online, explore that tool. It'll tell you about what things drive the model for your favorite species, whether it's spring heat or sea level rise or whatever it happens to be. You can learn a lot about the species that you care about and the ones that you have in your backyard by using this tool. Now, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about how all of that stuff 
plays into what we think about and what we see happening in North Carolina. Which species are vulnerable and kind of how climate works on species here in North Carolina. So I want to point out a couple of things. So as we go through the slides, when you see, let me get my pointer up here, if it will. There we go. Where you see the name of the bird at the bottom, so ruffed grouse here. Um, if it's in blue, that's a species that can be helped significantly by holding at one and a half degrees. I'll talk to you about some species like rough grouse that under the three degree scenario might lose almost 90% of their habitat in North Carolina, but under the one and a half degree is expected to retain more than two thirds of their existing habitat and their existing climate address, if you will. We have other birds that are predicted to lose 100% of their habitat in North Carolina due to climate change at three degrees, but none of their habitat at one and a half degrees. So it's really critical that we think about holding that line, keeping that, um, uh, keeping that climate change as low as possible. In North Carolina, from Audubon's perspective, we want to look at all the species we have a chance to impact, right? So it's breeding species, the ones that are here with us mostly for the summer. It's the wintering species, waterfowl and other things that are just here in the winter. And then a group of birds that we call passage migrants that just move through our state on their way to their wintering grounds. So we're going to break that down into each of those groups and talk about the groups within that that are the most, most vulnerable. Um, I hope you see some of your favorite birds in here, and I hope those favorite birds have a blue square <laughs> instead of a red square um, so that we can talk about things you can do to, to, to help those birds. So on our vulnerable list of 204 species for North Carolina, 85 of them are breeding, like this red-headed woodpecker. This is one of, the, one of those birds I was talking about that under the three-degree scenario is expected to lose 100% of its climate address in North Carolina. Um, but if we hold to one and a half, um, that number goes to zero. It becomes stable or improving if we stay at one and a half degrees. Most of our birds, most of our birds at the, of the breeding birds are forest birds. Uh, a really high percentage of our birds, um, over two thirds, are forest related birds um, on this vulnerable list of breeders. Um, a lot of them, again, are most affected by extreme spring heat, heavy rain events, and urbanization. Think about the mountains, uh, all the urbanization that's happened around the Asheville area, places like that. We're blessed with National Forest and Great Smoky Mountains National Park that act as strongholds or places that that's not going to happen. So we look at Western North Carolina really as a stronghold for the whole um, U.S. for some of these species. This is just a breakdown of the other groups. So the red part of the pie chart are the forest birds, but you can see there's, there's also coastal birds, um, urban birds and grassland birds um, also included in the, the breeding birds, but by far the group most affected uh, for our breeders are the forest birds. And it includes some of our really iconic species that a lot of folks know and love. And unfortunately, a lot of them on this list are Southern Appalachian specialists, birds that only breed in North Carolina in the mountains. Uh, in fact, uh, 27 of those 85 or so, or about a third of the species, are those species that are just in the Southern Appalachians, like this red-breasted nuthatch. Now, they'll occur in the rest of the state in the winter, right? But for breeding, they're just found in the mountains. Some other iconic mountain birds. We have breeding northern sawwood owls in the mountains, our smallest um, owl. Um, it looks pretty bleak for this bird, mostly because it's a spruce fir specialist. How many of you enjoy going up to the spruce fir in Western North Carolina? Uh, go up to Mount Mitchell and you see all those conifers. Um, they're already at the tops of all of our mountains, and so even a moderate increase in temperature is expected to force those spruce fir forests off the top of those mountains over time. And so birds like a sawwet that are tied to those habitats, um, it's, it doesn't look good for them. Now, how many of you, since you're here in the museum, how many, how many of you know John Gerwin, who works here at the museum? And he's done this um, science cafe several times. 
John and I spent four of the best years of our wasted lives uh, chasing yellow-bellied sapsuckers. And uh, thank you, Chris, for helping, so helping us do that work. Um, yellow-bellied sapsucker only nests in western North Carolina, but is found across North Carolina in the winter. Um, this is a bird that can be helped dramatically by holding at one and a half degrees. It's a northern hardwood specialist, loves sugar maples. I, I would love to talk to you about sapsuckers. We, we spend a lot of time in the woods. For bird nerds in the audience, they poop every two and a half minutes. Just... <laughs> <laughs> they, they eat sap, so it runs right through them, you know. Um, so some of the birds that are breeders in the western part of the state are these kind of iconic, beautiful wood warblers, right? The mountains are known. Birders flock to the mountains in the spring to see magnolia warblers and golden wing warblers and cerulean warblers and a bunch of others. Again, keep in mind and, and remember these blue squares. All these guys can be helped significantly um, by, by holding at one and a half degrees. Now, I've been a primary researcher on golden wing warblers for about 15 years. In fact, my first job with Audubon was to do golden wing warbler surveys. And we already see some of the effects of climate change. Uh, our birds are occurring higher. We have the highest golden wing warblers in the world. In western North Carolina, we have birds breeding up at Bradley Gap on the, the Appalachian Trail, about 5,500 feet. Um, that's the highest golden wing in America. Um, but he's already up there at the top, you know, so he doesn't have very far to go uh, if climate change continues. We've also, we've been using some pretty advanced technology. We use geolocators on golden wings to find out where they go in the winter. Tiny, tiny little geolocators. And the first year that we put them on, we got a bunch of birds back, took all the geolocators off, to sent them off to be analyzed, and they all failed on the same day from a heavy rain event. So even the technology is impacted by these heavy rain events. Some of the other birds, black-throated blue, black burnian, again, all these really iconic, beautiful wood warblers. Almost all of our warblers are on this vulnerable list. North Carolina has 23 breeding species of warblers and 21 of them are vulnerable to climate change. Not all of the climate vulnerable birds are in the mountains though, and so, Brown-headed nuthatch. How many of you put up a brown-headed nuthatch box? Audubon has asked folks to do that, and we've got close to 14,000 out across the state now. Um, they're vulnerable to climate change, but can be helped by holding um, in check, holding the temperature rise in check. Gray cat birds, a lot of you probably have those in your yards and hedgerows. Even our grassland birds, eastern meadowlark, bobolink, um, and some of our coastal birds, things like least tern, especially vulnerable to heat stress and, and sea level rise. Um, a bare sand nester love the inlets, and so when sea level rise happens, they get inundated. Um, and a bunch of our marsh birds uh, are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise. So all the rails, black rail, king rail, clapper rail. We move on to our non-breeding species. So we do get a, a good chunk of species that that don't breed with us, about 120 on the list are, are non-breeders. About 83, about the same number as the breeding species are wintering species with us. And then, uh, you know, 36 or so are just pure passage migrants. The chart kind of flips, and most of these birds are coastal. So the blue are the coastal species. So most of our wintering species are water birds. Um, it's gonna be things like um, seaside sparrows and, um, uh, salt marsh sparrow, Nelson sparrow, a number of our waterfowl that winter with us in North Carolina. If you've ever been to our sanctuary in Pine Island, things like northern pintails and American green winged teal, um, all those birds are vulnerable to climate change. Even some of our really iconic um, beach birds that we're used to seeing uh, on the beaches in the winter, sanderlings and semi-palmated plovers, um, a number of our spectacle birds down at the coast, things like 80,000 snow geese at Pungo or 35,000 tundra swans at Madame Mesquite, both of those birds are vulnerable to climate change. The passage migrants, these are birds that usually nest somewhere farther north and then go through North Carolina on their way to South or Central America, right? 
a number of them are these kind of really long distance migrants. Think things like red knot that are gonna breed way up on the tundra and then overwinter in South America. Or boreal um, nesting warblers like Cape Mays or um, Nashville warbler. Some of these birds that are farther north that just pass through North Carolina and don't stay for the winter. Um, we have a number of those species. They do tend to be vulnerable because they are such long distance migrants. A lot of them have really high energy demands. And so things that happen with climate change can really exacerbate um, their ability to, re to respond to climate impacts. So there's uh, five main takeaways from my perspective on, on what the report tells us, right? One of those is that um, almost all of our birds are vulnerable, but two thirds are especially vulnerable to climate change risks uh, in the US. And again, that includes for us in the East, urbanization, extreme spring heat, sea level rise, and heavy rain events. That kind of the loss of that just you know, every four days in the mountains, we'd get a passage of a front and we'd get our half an inch of rain and then it'd be clear for two or three days and we'd have another passage. Now we get 12 inches in three days um, and then it's dry for two months. So all those things are really endangering our birds. But the most important takeaway for me is that the science shows that if we can hold, if we can, if we can basically adopt the Paris Accord, right, and say 1.5 degrees is where we want to stay, we want policies that keep us there, 75% of our birds, two-thirds of the birds in North Carolina significantly improve if we're able to hold there. I think it's really important to, to think about these threats. Um, I, I think one of the things that's hard for people to wrap their heads around with, with climate and even with these specific threats is how does that work? Like how does that, how does that drive a bird to extinction, right? Again, I think a lot of times we think birds have the ability to fly, they, they leave, they do something different. But there's a couple things about bird biology, especially land birds, that I think you need to know and understand. One of those is that most of our songbirds have high sight fidelity, as biologists like to call it. And so that Phoebe that nests on your porch comes back to your porch every year. The same bird, not just Phoebes in general, but the same bird usually. The wood thrush likes his little piece of woods. The veery that nests on Grandfather Mountain or at Bass Lake and Blowing Rock. We caught the same veery in the same rhododendron bush five years in a row. And he goes to the Amazon every winter, but comes back to that same rhododendron bush every year. They'll try to do that as long as they can find a mate and lay eggs, they will come back to the same places year after year after year. What happens over time is when that climate space becomes inhospitable, it usually doesn't happen overnight. What happens is their productivity declines over time. Maybe one year they lose all their eggs to rain events. The next year they lose all their eggs or chicks because of extreme spring heat. Or if you're at the coast, they, leave their whole, they lose their whole clutch of eggs because of sea level rise, a high tide that inundates the oyster catcher nest. Over time, over that bird's life cycle, instead of being productive and replacing itself, plus some hopefully, they become a sink, what, what ecologists call a sink, a place where they put in lots of effort, but they don't produce any young. That's the way climate change works on birds. It's a kind of a death by a thousand cuts. Um, it's not usually a dramatic all at once, they're all gone. What happens though is at the northern end of the range where the suitability is getting better, those birds do better. And so we look from 1980 to 2020 and it looks like the birds have shifted 50 miles north or whatever. It's not the individual bird, it's the population. That's really important because what it means is the birds that you now host need you. Right, And the things that we're asking folks to do are kind of two-pronged. Every bird species in North America is gonna experience some change from climate. 
as we said before, sometimes it's beneficial if you're at the northern edge of the range for a species that's shifting north, or if you're a bird that likes it hotter. We're already getting wood storks in North Carolina a lot more, nesting, swallowtailed kites are moving into North Carolina, roseate spoonbills are starting to show up in North Carolina. So birds that we think of as tropical are starting to make their way up. But every bird is being affected by climate change. And the things that we can do, that you can do, kind of fall into two categories. The first is protecting and managing the places that birds need now. The, the bird that's in your yard needs your help. It wants you to plant native plants <laughs> so that it has more food. It wants you to put up nest boxes. It wants you to retain your forest. It wants you to keep your cats indoors. It wants you to do all these personal actions that you can do that will help make it better for those individual birds. Evolution and population change acts on individuals, right? It typically doesn't act on the population as a whole. It acts on individuals. We forget that sometimes. What that does for me, though, is it, it gives us power, right? It gives us hope. It gives us a chance to plant those plants, take those classes, learn how to do it better, um, to work on making our habitat that we control, whether it's a a pineapple sage on the third floor deck of a condo, or whether it's 100 acres of forest, but making that as bird friendly as it possibly can be for as long as it possibly can be. For some of these species, it may get too hot, or it may get too dry, or whatever those things are. A lot of our species are really tied to a particular habitat type, or a particular even tree species sometimes. As an aside, to give an example, Magnolia warbler, which nests very sporadically in the mountains in kind of spruce bogs, lines its nest with spruce rootlets. It is not going to be where there's no spruce. So if we lose our spruce, we will lose our magnolia warblers, right? So we have some birds that are like that, but a lot of our other birds are a little more generalist than that. Even a wood thrush likes forest, but it can be pine forest, it can be mixed forest, it can be deciduous forest. You can make a difference for those birds. But we also need folks to take collective action because these holding temperatures worldwide to one and a half degrees, doing all this stuff we need desperately to do for birds today in our own spaces, that won't get us there. We need folks like all these people that participated in Audubon's Lobby Day last year here in Raleigh to tell our legislators and tell our leaders, look, this is happening. We, can, we don't even have to argue whether people are causing it or not or any of those things. It's happening. Go to the coast. The North Carolina Climate Office just released a report um, that shows that Wilmington, as a good example, last year had over 150 days of sunny day flooding, just high tide flooding. By 2080, the city is predicted to have sunny day flooding every day of the year. That's from sea level rise. It's happening. We don't need to argue whether we caused it or nature's doing it on some big grand cycle or whatever, it's happening. The question is, what are we gonna do about it? How are we gonna fix it? How are we gonna prepare for it? And so we need folks like these folks in the picture and like you folks here in the room to take those collective actions and really demand some action. You know, we, we need it in our big cities, we need it on our farms, we need it in our forests. We, we need to be thinking about the effects of climate change. And so there's lots of ways for you to help. The handout that I gave you has some tips and website addresses and all those kinds of things. The, the um, October issue of Audubon Magazine has a really nice um, section on individual actions you can take. Um, almost every museum, Audubon chapter, um, Wildlife Society chapter, North Carolina Wildlife Federation, Everybody's out there working hard for pollinators and native plants and birds and policy change and all that stuff. If we're gonna do anything about this, we have to collectivize it and we need you to take those actions. If you're not comfortable talking to a legislature, um, plant a native plant, put up a bird box. <laughs> but we, we need you to, to take those actions and you can make a difference. I think this study shows us that there is hope. Uh, oftentimes with climate change, it's really hard to remain hopeful, right? 
But from a bird perspective, you can make a difference. And with that, I'll be glad to take questions. Well, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing. And let's take questions. Uh, so the way it works, yeah, raise your hands at me and at Katie if you have questions. We have microphones that will move around the room. So make sure that we get a microphone to you before you start with your question because there's people way in the back who won't hear you if you don't have a microphone. You're first. Well, uh, cl climate change aside, I wonder if any work is being done to quantify the loss of insects through overuse of pesticides. Yes, so you, you've probably read some things about the, the insect apocalypse. <laughs> um, and, you know, again, it's just like with birds. We've seen historical evidence that people have caused it in the past and that we're still causing it, right? Um, I just, uh, we've, we've been working a lot on chimney swifts. So I'll use them as an example. So a lot of folks are really enamored with chimney swifts. Um, you know, the, the museum here has events, Wake Audubon has events, we have events all over the state celebrating chimney swifts. Some really interesting experiments have been done with what chimney swifts have been eating for the last 90 years. And the way that happens is um, sometimes a big roost site, which you've ever seen a roost site, sometimes we'll have 10,000, 30,000 birds use it consistently year after year. Occasionally one of those chimneys will get capped after 80 years of use. And what happens is you've got a meter of poop at the bottom of that chimney. And you can excavate that just like a geologist would. And what we see is this horizon line in the 50s when DDT became popular, where chimney swifts diets shifted from beetles to true bugs, from coleopterans to homopterans, right? And they had to make that shift because there were no beetles left to eat, right? And at that same moment in time, we start to see this gradual 2 to 3% per year decline in chimney swifts. Like at that same time, they, they kind of co-evolved with beetles. <laughs> now they've adapted, but maybe not as successfully as they need to to continue that. If you add to that deforestation in the Amazon where they go in the winter and all those things, again, most of these bird conservation issues are like climate change. There's, there's multiple things that are driving that productivity down. And one of those things is the loss of insects. And one of the best things you can do is plant native plants. Um, Audubon is working hard on this nationally and at the state level. Uh, we have a number of resources on our website to talk about native plants and where you can buy them here in the state. Um, just again, to give you a little factoid from a bird nerd, um, an average chickadee nest takes about 6,000 soft-bodied caterpillars to get those young out of the nest. It's about 1,000 about 1, soft-bodied insects, insects per chick. Um, a privet and um, um, a ginkgo and all those species of exotics don't host very many insects at all. And usually they host a butterfly that likes the nectar on the pretty flower, but they don't host the caterpillar of that butterfly, right? We need the oaks that support 600 and some species of insects. Um, thank goodness Raleigh is the city of oaks. Now if we could just get those tree protection zones widen just a little bit um, around all this development. But it's a great question. All that stuff is linked and, and we're starting to see some evidence that climate change is directly affecting the insect population as well. Um, you know, the shift to more mosquitoes in urban areas, uh, which we live with here in Raleigh uh, horribly. There are more mosquitoes in Raleigh, I think, than at the coast now. But um, Yeah. Uh I, uh, I'm right here. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> we, my wife and I, we put bird feed out all the time, and but we move a lot too. So when you say that the birds come back to the same place all the time, well, if we put bird feed out at one location and we move to another city, how well do the birds then adapt to now all of a sudden not have any food? Um, they actually adapt pretty well, and I'll, and I'll give you a, a, a little observational science to, to hopefully bear that out. So folks who have feeders know that unless it's like sleeting, you see them, the mixed flock comes through, there's a bunch of birds at your feeder for maybe an hour, and then they all seem to disappear for, for a little while, and then later they'll come back, cycle through. What they're doing is their normal kind of territorial searching, 
Um, even when there's a good food source, they will keep up that kind of rotation through the neighborhood. So, and it's really good because when somebody leaves or somebody quits feeding or whatever, they're still in that knowing what's in the neighborhood, knowing what's available. Now, again, if you've got a big storm and there's a good source of food, they'll park it for the day. Um, but they keep up that normal cycle. Those chickadees and tit mice are leading the pack, and they're making sure everybody's cycling through the neighborhood. Yep. Who's Others wave at me. <laughs> okay. You go that way, I'll go that way. <laughs> Great questions. So my question is not really a temperature per se, but uh, I understood that uh, 80 some percent of fresh water is underground. However, we are depleting so fast, we are not recharging it. And I understood that uh, we are losing all the surface wa water also because of that. And I was wondering that how those water level things affecting all these birds, because uh, even seabirds require that the fresh water, right? Right, right. I mean, nobody can live without the salt water. Well, we have a in few species that do pretty well. Yeah, really they can feel salt, tight, but uh, yep. I understand even seabirds require that uh, fresh water. Right, right. So I'm wondering uh, how, uh, you know, this group studies or do something with this, that uh, depleting uh, the ground, underground waters, because I understood it's so bad. It's, I understood that some part of the India they're talking about it so within a couple of years. It's a run out of water. Even the U.S. Right. too, that year. Right, and we, we have certain, we have, we have the, the pressures from urbanization even in the, in the U.S. And are, the farmers are really, too. Really farmers are yet, uh, pumping out so fast, right? Right, right. Well, and, and again, some of that depends on the vegetation that's on top of, that, of the ground where you're at and how much can be recharged. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting new partnership, which ought to be involved with the Southeastern Partnership for Forests and Drinking Water. Um, find that, that the retention of canopy, the, the retention of mature forest, actually sequesters more water than any other land cover type. Um, and a lot of the watersheds, the surface drinking water watersheds in North Carolina are looking at retaining as much forest as possible in their service areas, right? right. Whether it's around Falls Lake or... And I understood um, there is a, a law that the Congress or whatever that they came up some regulations for 2040, but the, we, by then it it'll may be, be gone, too late. Right, yep. Well, we also know some, uh, again, back to native, like to native plants and native systems, right? The foresters will tell us that a, a loblolly pine, which are kind of plantation forest plantations, use up to 10 times more water than a longleaf stand does, right. than, the, than the longleaf pine. Um, so agriculture and even forestry have affected the ability of the ground to recharge that water. And we have to think about that. Um, as it gets scarcer and scarcer and scarcer, I think people continue to look at kind of technology as the answer, you know, desalinization plants the coast and all these other kinds of things, but um, we've got well, to do a better job of retaining that water. Right. Um, some of the study indicated, I think, even the human beings are going to be missing fresh water and we may not be able to survive. Right. That's what I understood. And that may not be too far. Well, you know, if you go down that rabbit hole far enough, I mean, folks yeah. say that the... the that in the 22nd century, all the big wars are going to be fought over water instead of oil. Yeah, so, I don't have a question. Um, <laughs> simple. So, so wave at me if you've got questions. Wave, I need to want to see hands so I know where to move microphones around. Well, can I have a very quick one? Okay. Let's get you a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Let's get you a mic. To I want to hear it too. fellow Raleighites. Um, I live near a watershed. And this is a very, very important thing to talk about, especially what you just said about how you have to have the forest and you have to have the clean water. So Crab Tree Creek is a very major stormwater avenue for the city of Raleigh to have good drinking water. So we were going right now, major infrastructure changes. Number one big thing is also we're growing. We all know this. Here's the deal. We have to grow smart. And we recently had permature or some sort of okay, 
to extend the Six Forks Road, look it up. The Six Forks Road extension was stopped at a watershed in Wetland that is at Hodges Road. Look at Atlantic, look at Hodges. Um, I am in communication, but nothing has, you know, you, they, they basically okayed a bridge that would then go over a nesting ground for some very, very unique birds. And one of them could have been um, the Virginia rail that I have witnessed. I live near the area. I walk there every day. So your city council has on it Nicole Stewart, who is into conservation. I encourage people to say, I heard about, I, I haven't been able to find it. If anybody goes onto the Raleigh government, looks for the corridor, they're looking for ways for the Capitol Boulevard corridor to bring more people, more people in cars to come into the city. There are better ways, but commercial developers from outside of our city are looking at ways to develop it. And they can do so by using such buzzwords as affordable homes. We love the idea of affordable housing within city limits. However, it must not be at the sacrifice of our watershed and our wetland. There's migratory birds, there are wild waterfowl, there are egrets, there are herons. So this is something that I am personally very, very passionate about. I came here tonight to listen to you to find out what I could do. So I, as a you know, person that's just alive here at this moment in time, I recognize that just as the uh, Dorothea Dix Park was going to be subjected to commercial real estate and changed and, and kept exclusive, now it's open to all of Raleigh, the Six Forks Road extension must not occur. <laughs> Well, I would say if, for anybody in the room, if you're passionate about these conservation issues, there's, there's a place for you to, to find like-minded folks and work on these issues, whether it's with Audubon um, or Conservation Trust for North Carolina or, or any Wake Audubon, any, any of those groups welcome that passion. That's what we need. We've got we've to all work together to, to make these things happen. Where's our next? Over here. Hey. Um, so w I like how you address so many of the different threats, um, but one thing that we hadn't really addressed yet that I was kind of curious is how in, your, in the analysis of, I wanted to hear your thoughts on how with the warming climate, how that would affect the timing of migration, and how that might then affect the populations. Yeah, it's a great, a great question. And a lot of work is, is going into this with birds because we're seeing, especially for long distance migrants, if you think about a bird like a Canada warbler that's gonna overwinter in the Andes in South America, he doesn't know what's happening in the Southern Appalachians when he leaves and starts heading back home, essentially, to breed. Um, the timing of, or, or the phenology as it's called, of, of when is spring at its peak? You know, when does leaf out happen? We know birds really depend on bud break um, migrant birds use that bud break, as it's called, when, when the spring foliage is just starting to, to break. Um, that's really heavy insect loads are occurring at that time. All the overwintering eggs for those caterpillars have hatched, and they're starting to eat those buds, and the birds are eating those insects. Um, and so if you're a Canada warbler or another species coming from a great distance, um, and spring is two weeks late, or it was two weeks early and you missed bud break, that has an impact on your ability to, to be productive. Um, and so the phenology is that disruption of the normal phenology is really um, being studied greatly right now. And we see it in a number of species. Um, with birds, it's complicated because often on the wintering grounds, they also have high site fidelity on the wintering grounds. So, and a lot of times the males and females winter in different habitats uh, on the wintering grounds. And we see things like in the Caribbean, the females that are out of the mangroves and up in the uplands are being less productive and leaving the wintering grounds later because the habitat quality there is declining due to climate change. So they're missing the early spring 
that we're starting to have in the eastern U.S. So there's a lot of things like that that are, that are disruptive, that are disruptive to the system. It's a great question. I'm just curious how sensitive your vulnerability predictions are to the speed of the, the warming. So if we, if we still get to three degrees Celsius, but it takes an extra 100 years to get there, are, are we still going to lose the same species? Yeah, so these were modeled on a prescribed time frame, right? So we were modeled to 2050 and 2080, and almost all the results are shown for the 2080 scenario, but other scenarios have been run. Um, and it does make a difference, obviously, and mostly because it gives the plant communities more time to respond to the climate change, which the birds depend on, right? Uh, if you've got a species that's tied to a specific climate variable like extreme spring heat, like a least turn, um, then, then whatever temperature we get to, whenever we get to it, it's going to have that effect, right? But for a lot of these other birds where it's a gradual loss of productivity and a gradual decline in the habitat quality, um, it makes a difference to delay that. Yep. yep. Thank you for a very educative presentation. Uh, my question is about um, policy solutions aside. Right. What are some of the um, low-hanging, high-impact fruits that everyday citizens can do to uh, keep the cap at 1.5 percent? Yeah, so there's a number of things, and they'll, they're also outlined online. Um, it's everything that you've always heard, right? Like reduce your own personal carbon footprint as much as possible. Uh, recycle as much as possible, especially petroleum-based products like plastics. Really try to do that. Aluminum. Uh, all the metals, all the, the recycling of those things really reduce carbon footprints, right? Um, there are other things you can do, um, you know, to switching to electric cars. It depends on the state you're in, right, where your electricity comes from. <laughs> but um, if, you, if you make those changes, you can have a big impact. Um, lobbying for things like smart planning, right? Why can't we get light rail in North Carolina? Like, why, why does that happen, <laughs> you know? Um, lobbying for those kinds of things and, and making those personal choices. You know, my, my current boss just bought a really nice uh, triple, a, a trip, whatever, a tandem that hauls two kids instead of just one. Uh, he just... He just bought a bicycle so he could take his kids to school and then come on to work on a bike instead of in his car, right? And we can't all do that, right? But where we have those opportunities, we need to make those choices. Uh, the other thing you can do, and I, and I really don't want to discount this, is, is to collectivize that concern. Um, Audubon has a number of ambas climate ambassador trainings every year. Uh, we have lobby days. We do petition drives. We really push hard nationally and locally. Um, and it, you know, if birds can be your motivator, then let them be your motivator. You know, we've got um, Wake Audubon, for instance, lobbied hard to get uh, lights out, um, cooperation with county government, city government. Um, any of those kind of projects, that, that, you know, they're good for birds, but ultimately they reduce that carbon footprint and reduce the need for that extraction or that generation of power or whatever that we're seeing. Um, all those things make a difference. Um, and then on the habitat side, all those things we talked about, plant native plants, put up nest boxes, all that stuff, is, is really does make a difference because you want to drive that productivity as high as possible for as long as possible. It's a great question, though. And, you know, fortunately, a lot of, a lot of partners, not just Audubon, but uh, almost any environmental group out there has a big, long laundry list of things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, a lot of it does come down to policy, though. I've been working a lot on things like biomass, like is short cycle carbon a thing? Like should we even call it that? <laughs> you know, those kinds of questions uh, I think are important and people need to educate themselves about, about what our options are and, and how as a, a state and a community and a nation we can do better on making those choices. But it's a great, it's a great question. I think the thing that happens a lot of times is it's really easy to lose hope and to feel like you can't do anything as one person. And, and so look for those venues that allow you to combine your voices. And, and I think you will definitely get more done and you'll feel like you're accomplishing a lot. Yep. yep. Um, you mentioned cats earlier. Uh -huh. um, I know in Australia, cats are an invasive species and they've decimated or actually drove to extinction like 32 different types of birds. 
So um, how here in, in North Carolina, how do cats affect the bird population? Yeah, so the best estimates nationwide, and we don't have a good estimate just for North Carolina. Um, the estimate nationwide is about 2 billion birds per year uh, are killed by cats. Um, the best thing is to keep them indoors. Uh, I mean, truthfully, that's the best solution. Um, trap, neuter, and release programs, uh, while long-term effective, often have um, a long period of really devastating effects uh, locally, because um, the population typically goes spikes up really quick and then gradually declines, and so that spike up really quick can have a big, big impact. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, it's a really tough issue. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a cat person. Like, you know, I had a I had a cat that lived to be 23. You know, he's my my buddy. Um, so I I've, I really struggle with this sometimes. But the best solution is to keep him indoors, right? But then let him outside. Yeah, I mean that's that's the thing. And and as much as it kind of pains you not to let them outside, because I mean they're a wild. You know, in their hearts they seem like they're a wild thing. You know. Um, but that's, that's really the best solution. And just being, you know, it's like everything else, being a responsible pet owner, make sure that you spay and neuter and all that other stuff, you know, it's really, really critical. Um, it is a big issue, you know, we, again, this, with birds, it's kind of, we've put so many barriers, whether it's glass on skyscrapers and houses or cats or transmission corridors or open tar pits out west with, you know, uh, oil and gas extraction. Just we we keep throwing up these barriers. We keep fragmenting the forest. We do all these things that just shave off a little bit of productivity every year. That's the three billion birds report that we mentioned earlier. You know, a lot of people want to know how does that math work. You know, if cats kill two billion birds a year, how can you say we've only lost three billion birds over 50 years or whatever? But it's really the baseline. Like, how many breeding adults do you have every year to to start the process again? Um, and over time, we've lost three billion, you know, of, of that starting point. Um, all those birds every year are working really hard to lay eggs and raise chicks and all that stuff, and we're shaving off a whole lot of this, a uh, whole lot of that off the top, plus some. And so we get these really slow, gradual declines. Um, but we can, but a lot of that stuff we can change. We, you know, personal actions and collective action can change some of that. So it's a great question, though. And a lot of these don't have simple answers. It'd be great if we had some really simple answers. <laughs> Let's give Curtis one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. Thanks for sharing all the Audubon work that's going on, the report with us. And hey, thanks to all of you for coming out to the Science Cafe. I know you learned something new, but I hope you've got something good to take home, talk to your friends, family, and neighbors about, even share it with the people you don't like. They need to hear it too. And we'll see you back here next Thursday night at the Science Cafe. If you want to know what topics are coming up week after week, leave us your email address on the little survey form. We'll put you on the mailing list. That way you know what's coming up. Next Thursday night, in advance of Astronomy Days, we'll be doing an astronomy talk called Deadly Stars with a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. That's right here at the Daily Planet Cafe. Good night, everybody.